Hello, and welcome to the URI Honors Colloquium, Just Good Food. Uh, my name is Karen De Bruin, and I am the new director of the Honors, well, new. This is, I've just finished my first semester, almost, of, the, uh, of directing the, the Honors Program. So it's been really a lot of fun, especially this colloquium. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to start with a, just a few housekeeping details. Um, the exits are to the side of the stage. There's exits in the back. Um, the bathrooms are in the foyer, uh, there's no photos or video recording, um, and we do have a gender neutral bathroom, I just don't put in, I didn't put in my notes exactly where it is, I think it's the, both of them in the back are gender neutral actually. Um, all right, so we are now going to get started, uh, would you like to go on? So we're going to start. Um, we're going to start with the URI land acknowledgement. Um, the University of Rhode Island occupies the traditional stomping ground of the Narragansett Nation and the Niantic people. We honor and respect the enduring and continuing relationship between the indigenous people and this land by teaching and learning more about your history and present-day communities and by becoming stewards of the land that we too inhabit. To pay further tribute to the stomping ground uh, that we occupy and the Narragansett Nation and Niantic people, please welcome Heather Angel Mars Martins, who is council member for the Narragansett tribe and who will give a blessing. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't know why I put on mascara, because every time I hear those words, I get teary. Um, the acknowledgement is beautiful. It is appreciated. It is necessary. I'd like to share with you a gift that has been passed on to me in my older years. I'm a tribal elder now. This is a gift that was robbed of our people for many years, and that gift was language, to the point where my ancestors, my great-grandparents, my grandparents and parents wouldn't speak it because they were afraid for us having this gift. And, but you know, the world evolves, and we all adapt. And one of the things, I'm actually taking an intercultural communications course here at the university right now. And I haven't met my professor in person, but I love him. I love the lessons that he's teaching us. And I love language. I love your language. I am in love with mine as I'm learning it. And I would love to share a piece of it with you tonight. 
Kunupium Wami ni tam poag ka ni tan suck at a ki ak naha a gun suck Nishui Kwani kawesa ki tampanisha Wuch miski kwaneki ka Sachim kwani kawau Tapa ene on a way on Katantawit Wuchi wami Nu a wee a nook wan wo need he a wonk to bat in a on a way on katan to it wuchi woon again kisak ninash what I shared with you was welcome all my friends and relatives to the homelands of the Narragansett. I am third daughter morning sunrise of Red Doe and Chief Sachem Long Pine. I have asked the creator for his blessings upon all of you and all of your work. And I thank the creator for the beauty that he surrounds us with. And be it so, is Ninash. So thank you for allowing me to share a blessing with you I just wanted to say, as I had shared briefly, I've been a diabetic diagnosed for just over 20 years. And I've been on insulin for 17 of those years. Six times a day, I had to take insulin. My uh, A1C never got to where I wanted to be. And I found this program that introduced to me using food as medicine. And May 12th, my granddaughter's birthday, will be four years that I am insulin free. Four years for using food as medicine. Thank you for all you do. Thank you very much for a beautiful introduction uh, and land acknowledgement. Um, as we, we reach the close of this 59th URI Honors Colloquium, I would like to th heartily thank the organizers. I'd like for everybody to give a huge round of applause uh, to John Taylor and Marta gomez Chiari for the uh, incredible thought-provoking speaker series that they have pulled together uh, on, our, what, on, future, on what our future food systems could look like if we rooted them in sustainability, equity, and resilience. So thank you so much for pulling this all together. Could you stand up so we can see you? I would also like to thank the advisory panel to Just Good Food, that includes uh, Pierre, uh, Pierre Saint-Germain, I'm sorry, I'm a French professor, so it's really hard for me to read that with an American accent. Um, uh, Don Spears, Luanne Roth, uh, Patrick Bauer, and Mary Parlange. Um, this colloquium would not exist without the generous support of our sponsors, uh, including uh, the Office of the President and the Office of the Provost, um, who, and, and there's many others, um, who I'd like to thank deeply. Similarly, this colloquium would not exist without the full-time dedication of Anna Blake, our coordinator in honors, who has wrangled every last detail into place to bring us this incredible event. I don't know where she is, Anna. She's probably wrangling a detail as we speak. Um, I'd like to thank James and uh, Classroom Media Assistants uh, for their invaluable tech support. Um, Dave, La Dave Lavalle, there she is. Can we just turn around and see Anna? <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Anna. Um, Dave Lavalle and his team have ensured uh, excellent publicity of this event. And finally, and most importantly, I think, I'd like to thank the students from URI and from beyond, these students that have come also to every single colloquium event uh, that we've had here. Um, they are our future. May they take what they have been learning and lead us into a new era of food security, equity, and sustainability that brings greater happiness, community, and hope for all. 
I don't say that lightly because I have a three-year-old and a six-year-old. I'm an old mom, I know, but I've got a three-year-old and a six-year-old. And when I look at their future, I, 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 I am in fear. And I need you, the students. I really need you, the students, to create a hopeful future for, for my kids. So, uh, I'm going to change the slide here. Uh, so thank you for this beautiful colloquium. We have an incredible talk. I've, I've heard really incredible things about the, our speaker, who I will not introduce because somebody else will be introducing him. Um, but uh, I would like to uh, introduce next year's colloquium. Uh, did I get it? Yep. Uh, so the theme for next year's colloquium, uh, it's going to be our 60th honors colloquium. Uh, which will coincide with the continuing centennial of the College of Business 20, 20, 20, uh, 2022. Um, and this colloquium is entitled Business for Good, which is being organized by Doug Creed, who could not be here today. He's got a bit of a house emergency. Um, Sarai Argana and Christy Ashley. Could both of you stand up that who, who are, or could stand up here so you can see who our future organizers are? Business for Good. You can look for it for next year. And now to introduce our final speaker of the 59th URI Honors Colloquium, Just Good Food, is Nessa Richman, the Network Director of the Rhode Island Food Policy Council. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, and thank you for that blessing, Heather, as well. Um, we're honored to be co-hosting this last event of the series. The Rhode Island Food Policy Council is an independent statewide network of food system stakeholders. Our mission is to create a more equitable, accessible, um, economically vibrant, and environmentally sustainable food system for all Rhode Islanders. We have 25 council members who set our priorities and determine our strategic objectives. But we're also an open network, and anyone can participate in our work groups to collaborate, learn, and make new connections. Network members develop policy priorities and learn to communicate with state lawmakers to move our food system toward justice and resilience. If you want to get involved, you can learn more at rifoodcouncil.org. So to transition our current food system to one that grows healthy foods while employing sustainable and socially equitable practices, we need everyone at the table, citizens, scientists, economists, and politicians. Tonight, we're honored to welcome Dr. Ricardo Salvador, who has been doing high impact work with all of these groups toward that vision for more than 40 years. He will speak on the 21st century food system we deserve. Dr. Salvador is the senior scientist and director of food and environment program at the Union of Concerned Scientists. Before that, he served as a program officer for food, health, and well-being at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, where he was responsible for conceptualizing and managing the foundation's food system programs. And he earned his undergraduate degree in agricultural science from New Mexico State University and an MS and PhD in crop production and physiology from Iowa State University. He was an associate professor of agronomy at Iowa where he taught the first course in sustainable agriculture at a land-grant university. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Salvador. I'm impressed you're all here tonight. And I thank you for coming. And I also want to thank the organizers, Martha, John, the committee, I want to thank the Rhode Island Food Policy Council and everyone that's been involved in making this event possible. Uh, I have to tell you that I have never seen such a superb lineup of speakers in a colloquium series, never. Uh, what you folks have put together is really top shelf. And uh, so much so that there's really no point in my being here. But by the time that I found out who else had been on the slate, it was too late to pull out of a commitment. So uh, I'll just do my best to actually just launch from the excellent platform that all of the prior speakers have established. And so uh, what I'd like to do is tell you up front what the general theme here is. Um, we have a food system which is backward, it's inefficient, it's exploitative. 
we deserve a better food system. And I want to explain both what I mean by that and how to get there. Um, the problems are deep and the solutions need to be radical. And so uh, I want to begin by telling you that you folks, those of you that are motivated to come out on a frigid night to listen to a topic like this, are actually doing leading work nationally. And I want to tell you how I know that. Um, a few years back, um, we had an idea that we could construct a scorecard and go state by state figuring out how each individual state was doing in terms of their local food systems. And so I want to tell you a little bit about it. So um, we came up with these scores by pursuing the following methodology. Uh, you see here 10 different indicators of the food system. I won't read them for you. But in order to make our judgment on how well each state was doing in these categories, we use publicly available databases so that anybody here who wants to go scrutinize or do a different analysis for themselves can freely do so. So that was a constraint on the data gathering. But let me show you how this actually worked out. And I know that the thing you're most curious about is to see where Rhode Island is. So there it is. You're actually number six of 50 states in terms of how well you're doing in managing your food system. In general, the Northeast is where the highest scoring states are. So um, here I want to show you the specific indicator where you are the best in farm investments. You're number one in the nation in this category. By the way, these are all relative scores, you know, 50 states, and so the midpoint would be 25.5. So you're leading in terms of farm investments, and if you're curious what that means, here are some of the things that we evaluated. So uh, this means how much conservation uh, dollars, uh, these are federal dollars, are invested per 100 farm acres. How much in terms of conservation stewardship uh, program you were able to draw down, and so on. I, I won't read through all of this. I just wanted to give you a smattering of how we made the evaluations that I'm telling you about. Now, you may think that this is distorted by the very small scale of the state of Rhode Island, so I want to show you a couple of other indicators here. So uh, first of all, here's the next best for Rhode Island. It's number three. It's your food investments. So you are very good at bringing down federal funding for the programs that you're running within the state. So programs such as the local food promotion program, farmers market promotion programs, and so on. You can see the list uh, for yourselves. So you're not constrained by the resources that are available in the state. You're able to leverage federal dollars very effectively. And I know that the Rhode Island Food Policy Council and allies uh, have been actively focused on that. Now, in terms of the negative side of the ledger, things that are um, color-coded in uh, pink to red, here's an example where you score 27 uh, beyond, below the midpoint. So this is what are the dietary patterns and health outcomes associated with the food system. So here we looked at things such as the percentage prevalence of household level food insecurity, the percentage of adults who consume fruit less than once a day, and so on. So evaluating that gives us that Rhode Island is below the midpoint. And then on the final category, the one where you actually scored the worst, uh, these are social determinants. And here you can leave the, risk, the list for yourself and evaluate how the state feels to you when you see the indicators that we utilize. Even so, the worst score for Rhode Island has you above 13 other states in the United States. The, in general, the worst state was Louisiana. Uh, the bottom fifth was the Midwestern states. The best performing states where there's the best balance of these sorts of programs without all the negative environmental problems of the Midwestern states is the Northeastern uh, United States and the state of Washington. So I wanted to give you an idea of why I have the highest regard for the work that you folks are doing here. It's meaningful to the folks that are able to participate in the programs that you lead. So you are creating the sort of future for the food system that we want to talk about, but how can we extend that to the entire nation and hopefully to the entire globe? What we do in the entire nation actually ripples across the entire globe because for good or ill, the U.S. food system has become the template for how the food system develops around the planet. And so let's talk a little bit about this. There are are two reasons why I think that um, we need to work on a better food system. And so one of those is that we now understand better than we ever have how the planet actually works. Our current agricultural system is not predicated on understanding how the planet works because when we began to be agriculture, agricultural, 
We did not understand that, and we have not updated the practice of agriculture to reflect what we know about planetary dynamics. So just really quickly, to give you an example of what I mean by this, uh, we know that the planet uh, functions through a series of mutually interdependent cycles, with us being the utterly dependent organisms in this mutual exchange among the different cycles. So uh, here you have the different spheres of the uh, planet that we depend on. And uh, there is exchange among these different spheres that is affected by all agricultural activities. And so the fluxes consist of minerals from the geosphere uh, into the biosphere. The fluxes consist of biosphere emitting into the atmosphere and drawing down gases from the atmosphere. All of these in exchange with the hydrosphere, which is the largest by volume on the surface of the planet. There's a subset of that, the cryosphere, which we now understand is very important because of its albedo and reflectivity affecting climate change. So agriculture is involved in mining from the geosphere to produce fertilizers. It's involved in the hydrosphere because it's the biggest user of the 3% of fresh water that there is on the entire planet. It's involved in the biosphere because of the fact that we are now mining the atmosphere for nitrogen in order to fertilize crops, and also because we're emitting greenhouse gas emitting materials into the atmosphere. And the biosphere is a very thin layer, less than the width of a marathon than you might run, on which we are utterly contingent. And the agricultural system now is overwhelming the dynamics of that system. It's an interaction with that system, but we are now appropriating very large portions of that system. And so we now understand this and need to update the way that agriculture functions. Another reason that we deserve a better system than we have right now is just that we're paying for it. And I'm giving you just a very small example of this. This is essentially the annual cost of the Farm Bill, which is not the only cost that the public is extending for the food system. It's a $428 billion bill authorized really arithmetically every four years, although uh, the calendar calls for it to be over the history of the 22 Farm Bills that there have been. Every five years, we gear up to update it. So the current one costs $428 billion for those five years, and this is not the only cost. Uh, over the period of time where this nation has invested in developing the agricultural system, there has been massive investment in establishing universities like this and the network of science and teaching and extension that they represent, and also massive programs to establish the agriculture of the country as successful on the indicator of productivity. And so if we summed up all of that, this would dwarf the figure that I'm showing you here, but I'm just giving you this as an indicator. And I'll summarize, the reason why we deserve a better food system is that we know better. And secondly, because we're paying for it and we're paying for a very destructive food system. So we should get something better for what we're paying. So those are the two reasons. Um, very few of you, if anyone, will recognize this uh, uh, individual. He was the individual that founded uh, what we now know as the Visa Credit Card Network. He retired from Visa after having it uh, set up as a successful enterprise and uh, became a rancher in 1984. And becoming a rancher from having been a banker gave him a fairly unique uh, vantage point, and this is what he had to observe about the agricultural system. So no failure is more pernicious than that of institutions that are unable to achieve the very purpose for which they were created. Yet they continue to exist as they devour resources, demean the human spirit, and destroy the environment. There is no better paragon of this failure than the modern agricultural and food system, which destroys soil, poisons water, and degrades food. He became a rancher late in his career, so so he had no defensiveness around the sector. He evaluated it as he encountered it and as he saw it perform, and this was his opinion about the food system. That first part is the most damning part of it, that the food system does not meet the objectives which it was set up to uh, attend. So let's see if we can unpack that a little bit. This is usually news to most well-fed Americans because of the fact that as long as you have the economic power to command the system, to do whatever you want it to do, then you're not aware that the food system has necessarily any flaws. You are accustomed to abundance. You're accustomed to choice. But some of the things that he was referring to was the fact that 
Not everybody has that economic power, even in a wealthy country like the United States. So in our era, about 40 to 50 million people do not have that economic power. They actually experience hunger. So the bottom quintile of the population in the United States has the same food access as uh, people in countries like Egypt, uh, Pakistan, and Ukraine do, meaning that they expend about 35% of their disposable income to buy food, the bottom quintile of people in the United States. Think of it as countries like the ones I listed embedded within the United States. They're your neighbors. You, you know people in this quintile. And we also have a food system that actually promotes the stuff that is the very worst for us to eat. It makes us sick, as we heard. If we just take what the food system offers us over the course of our lifetime, it will make us sick. It also is something that is getting increasingly worse. Um, latest estimates are that by 2050, 60% of us will be obese, uh, whereas you know that is 30% right now. So that figure will double over the course of the next couple of decades. Now, Another feature of the system is that as we learned over the last couple of years, it is actually fairly vulnerable to um, disruption. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, before we're done. Another feature of the system is that it is so specialized in the production of monocrops, but the specialization is pervasive throughout the entire system. So there's a system that's specialized just in delivering particular cuts of beef to you, particular cuts of poultry to you, and so on. But it begins with the specialization in the field. And this specialization is not particularly well calibrated. Remember, I started out by saying we have a system which is inefficient. In the row crop system, one of the indicators of that inefficiency is that it is a massive polluter of the environment. One of the biggest polluters that there is there of the air, of the soil, of drinking water. Here you see an example of an algal bloom in Lake Erie a couple of years ago as a result of mismanaging uh, nutrients in the corn soy production system. Here's another uh, flaw of the system. I hope nobody here either will be offended or will disagree that this is a, a major flaw in the system. 96% of farmers are white. The demographics of the country are not 96% of people are white. For historical reasons, the land and the investments that I referenced five minutes ago have been vested in a very small sector of the population, making them wealthy. So this is a feature of the system that does not represent equity. And we'll come back and talk more about that detail as well. So those folks can proudly speak about the great experience they're having. It's undeniable. They're having a great experience because all of us are supporting them. And they'll brag in this part of the country of having been in farming for 10, 12 generations in the Midwest for five, six generations. But that is an inequitable feature of the system. And then lastly, a feature of this system is that it actually contributes to climate change, which is going to be a major limitation to the way that the system is able to perform and actually is beginning to occur as we speak. Now, all of these things could be reversible, and that's going to be the point by the time that we're done, but that's the family portrait of the contemporary agricultural system. So you can see, I hope, why we both know how to do better, we should do better, we deserve better, I'll repeat, if for no other reason, because we're paying for the system, so we should pay for something that's better than what we've summarized here. So I think that there's two major reasons that explain why we have the dysfunctions that we just reviewed very quickly. So one of the reasons has to do with the fact that we have an antiquated mindset to which we're applying our knowledge and our technology. And another reason has to do with the fact that economics and agriculture just do not work. They're completely broken. Uh, so let me expand on that, if that just seems like it's uh, you know, completely nonsensical. Um, you might be familiar with all of the modern contraptions in high technological application in agriculture. I mean, there's drones, genetically modified organisms, uh, essentially farm machinery that is now satellite guided and so on. So you may wonder how anybody in their right mind could talk about the agricultural system being backward. And so what I mean is that this agricultural system from its very beginning was about extracting resources. So yes, we have a lot of technology that we apply to the system now, but we're applying it to the outmoded feature of agriculture, which is to extract resources. We are now better at extracting resources. 
That's what the algal bloom that I showed you is one instance of doing. And so one thing that we need to focus on then is how to better apply our knowledge so that instead of a system like somebody's vision of the future that you see here in which essentially you turn it into a video game, really no room for people, really the returns are to the capital that's invested to this and so the capitalists, the, you know, the venture investors are the people that actually are rewarded from participating in this system, uh, depends on understanding that from the very beginning what we've been doing is appropriating resources and concentrating them in very narrow, adequate staging areas for the production of food. From the very beginning of agricultural history, that's what we've been doing. In modernity, it looks something like this. We'll come back and take a look at this to interpret it two ways. But in essence, this represents all of the different supply chains that reach over the entire planet and concentrated on specific staging areas around the planet that we call farm fields, or at their largest extensions, we call them bread baskets. There are seven major ones of them around the planet. Agriculturalists are not magicians. They're not performing a feat of magic in order to make those bread baskets produce more than they were producing before doing what I'm illustrating here. What we are doing is basically overcoming the natural carrying capacity of the specific biome by bringing resources from other areas using fossil fuel and concentrating them in this area, therefore intensifying the cycling of nutrients, organic matter, which gives us the productivity that we see in fuels like this. And so uh, because this is extractive, uh, this system can only continue for as long as the source of all of those different resources uh, is uh, not exhausted then that is something that needs to be rethought. Now, the economic side of this basically has to do with the simple observation that the market is inefficient because it cannot work the way that we've set up the agricultural system because the key signals under which a market works are not there. They're absent in our modern design of the industrial agricultural system. So let me explain what this is, and I don't want you to be afraid that, that this will be a, an anti-capitalist screed. I'm actually appealing to the ideas of Adam Smith and pointing out that they're not being applied in the way that he envisioned. So to give you an idea, we all need to remember that his major work, the work that most people point to as um, sort of the establishment of capitalist economics, the wealth of nations, was actually the follow-up on a predecessor that was called um, the theory of moral sentiments. And what he was trying to work out with a lot of people in that era was whether human beings, flawed as we are, are smart enough to be able to figure out how to govern ourselves without having to depend on benevolent kings. This is what they were working on in, during that period of time. And so he came up with this theory of capitalism to explain how pursuing self-interest it was possible to come up with a society where everybody did better. This was his intent. And you see here a direct quotation from The Wealth of Nations where he thought, that this system working well would provide well for everybody, in abundance for everybody. In particular, the people he cites here, they who feed, clothe, and lodge the whole body of the people. These are some of the most exploited people in modernity. So this is not happening according to Anna Smith's vision. And one of the reasons is that essentially we have complete market breakdown. Now, let me expand further on this. His theory, as you all know, so you, you'll just need to pardon me for patronizing here, the theory of the market is basically that if we have complete access to information and we're all free to make our choices, that buyers operating in their self-interest, trying to find the cheapest things, and sellers operating in their self-interest, trying to compete on quality and efficiency, will produce the best outcomes for everybody involved. That's the theory of the market. But instead, in the food system, as we've just heard and as you've heard during the entire colloquium series, the more profitable the food system is, the sicker we all get. We don't get the best outcome for everybody. And the reason is that by definition, the stuff that is the most profitable for the food system is the most highly processed, it's the highest value add for them. So that's what they promote. Those are the choices that they give us and that's what makes us sick, chronically sick. And why is that? because there is no feedback loop from the fact that the food is making us sick to the people that are producing the food. Likewise, there is no feedback loop from the folks that are polluting the environment from over-applying and mismanagement nutrients that says, don't do that anymore. We've purposefully broken those feedback loops 
are more accurate to say in the case of the environment that they never existed and that there's active resistance to putting those feedback loops in there. So the market can't work. We shouldn't be surprised that there's market breakdown in agriculture. So already you should be seeing some of the things that need to be addressed if we are to come up with the food system that we deserve. And so I just want to visually remind you here that the holy of holies of capitalist economics is completely inoperational when it comes to the food system. Supply and demand for the things that we value just do not operate. There's even a bait and switch when you engage with the food system because here you think that you're buying food, that you're saving time, that you're buying convenience because somebody else is doing everything for you. You just get to wish for what you want and you have it instantaneously. And the bait and switch is that what you're buying is diabetes, high blood pressure, chronic disease, and premature death. So, one other thing that I should remind you of, I told you that we were going to come back to this and give it a different interpretation, is that the only place where the market system is working is in the return to capital investment in the system. In other words, social capital doesn't exist, natural capital doesn't exist, the feedback loops that condition us to replenish those and to attend to those capitals just do not exist. It's the financial capital that we pay the closest attention to. So that means we can exploit labor. That means we can exploit nature. And we're completely sanctioned in doing that. There's no market penalty for doing that. And so I mentioned that this applies to labor. Um, it, it just so happens that this uh, last week, I think you all know that there's a new documentary out called Emancipation uh, that features the story of the individual pictured here, known popularly as Whipped Pete an actual enslaved person who was able to escape uh, slavery. Um, and the documentary tells somewhat the, the story. But I'm showing it to you here to basically remind ourselves that agriculture from its inception, and including up until the present, would not be possible without the exploitation of labor. And so the return to capital that I mentioned earlier is the driving force. Everything else in agriculture is degraded, extracted, completely depleted. It's the business model of the agricultural system. Um, some of you may recognize E.O. Wilson, who I think best describes why we're in the predicament that we're in. And I think it's, it's relevant for an academic audience like this one. Um, here's an observation of his. The real problem of humanity is that we have paleolithic emotions. We have medieval institutions. Begging your pardon, we're in one of those right now and godlike technology. So that means that even though we want to do things as if we were still living hundreds and thousands of years ago with that mentality, uh, in other words, we're just farming God's green earth uh, without really paying attention to what we now understand about how both society, the economy, the planet works, uh, but we have really powerful means to do what we intend to do. So if what we intend to do is exploit, boy, are we powerful in terms of doing that. Just to give you one example in, in this nation, uh, there are, if you're not familiar with them, there are hypoxic zones all over the planet. They're essentially what happens at the river deltas of major rivers that are geologically draining and sweeping vast areas of their continental watersheds. It's a natural thing for them to enrich their uh, delta areas. What is not natural is for them to be so enriched with nutrients that they actually kill anaerobic organisms where that hypoxic zone is created chronically over a long period of time and over larger extensions than would occur naturally. There's over 80 of these documented around the planet. So here in the United States, we have several of those of various different scales. And if you had to actually do the work of carting all of the soil, carting all of the phosphorus, carting all of the nitrogen that would be necessary in order to deliberately pollute the mouth of the Mississippi River at the Atchafalaya Basin, the largest hypoxic zone in the United States, you can already imagine the tremendous amount of actual physical work that's going on there. And that's just a side effect of what we actually think we're doing. We think we're producing a lot of corn. But in fact, what we're doing is remobilizing all kinds of nutrients all over the planet with the deleterious effects that I'm describing here. So this is what E.O. Wilson meant. So here's what we could have instead. We could have a food system that would guarantee that there's no hunger. 
where the only choices would be healthy food, where instead of a brittle, linear, specialized food system, we would have resilient food webs, where the mode of production is informed by the way that we understand the planet works. That's agroecology. In other words, we don't just have a farm that happens to be outdoors. We are working with the outdoors in order to produce our food. We would have a system that's socially and racially, racially equitable. Everyone would equally benefit, and we could have a system that is actually climate positive, that is not in the net emitting greenhouse uh, warming gases, it is actually helping us to draw down those gases and to keep the temperature of the planet stable. That's what we could have. We know enough to produce this system. So um, I don't need to tell you this, but of course it's not an easy project, so let me tell you what some of the things are that I think need to happen in order to create this system. So, first of all, the United States needs to join the rest of the civilized world. It is but one of two countries, the other one being Israel, that has refused, intentionally has refused to sign the United Nations Declaration to the Right to Food. Now, here's what this declaration means. Essentially, you can go read the text of the United Nations, uh, but essentially what it says, just as it's absolutely essential for all of us to thrive, to have access to clean air, to oxygen, to clean water, to light, and nobody in their right mind, to date at least, has figured out a way to ration those, price, and price them, and control our access to them. We have a right to these things because we are alive. They say it's, it is analogous because it is absolutely essential for us to thrive as human beings that we have access to a nourishing supply of food. Therefore, it should be a human right. And the nations of the world have signed on to it. Now, this is manifesting in lots of ways around the planet, but the United States has stated that the reason that the country is not signing on to it is that they think that's flawed reasoning, and secondly, it would be against the interest of the business sector. And so that's the rationale for not participating. Now, uh, let me tell you the way that something like this would work. We already have a template for it. We have a food safety net in the United States, the Supplemental Nutrition uh, Assistance Program. It is a system that kicks in when folks do not have adequate income to ensure, get ready for this, it's not what you're expecting, to ensure that grocers don't lose business. That's the major purpose of the system. Now, that means that we provide families of limited means with sufficient resources to be able to buy food at groceries, and then those companies don't lose the profit that they could be getting from 40 to 50 million people that otherwise would have limited access to food. But we have such a system. It is a template for how we could establish a system like this. Canada has made a better choice. So Canada has made the choice as of 2015 that families below the poverty level have a guaranteed income, $6,000 per year per child, and now $10 a day to help with childcare in those families. So that's the way that this uh, UN right to food is showing up in different places. And this is not an abstract idea. I'll tell you a little bit more about efforts to get it adopted state by state in the United States. But first of all, let me point out that we know how to do this. In other words, we would invest as a public to make sure that if families are not able to purchase food, that they not suffer on account of that circumstance, a particular circumstance in the life of a family. And so uh, the recent experience that we had, uh, these data come from the article that you were just taking a look at here, was the establishment of the pandemic, of just during the pandemic, of just such a program. It's called the Child Tax Credit Program. It's just expired. Um, but what that program did was to decrease child poverty 14.2%, uh, or sorry, from 14.2% to less than 5.6% uh, in 2021. And what it took was to pass that child tax credit it provided three stimulus checks. Those were the three different delivery mechanisms. This was established by the American Rescue Plan. Uh, there was a moratorium on eviction, so families' uh, misfortune would not be compounded by suddenly becoming homeless. There was an increase in unemployment benefits. There was an increase in SNAP benefits, the program that I just described, and there was housing assistance. So we know how to do this. It's just that we're willing to tolerate that in an environment where business profits are not at stake as they were during the pandemic, where the issue was, well, if people aren't working and people aren't in their income, where are businesses going to do? There's going to be a massive disruption of business. Well, the federal government is going to invest to make sure that money is going through us and we continue to buy 
and businesses continue to thrive. And boy, did that work. We spent more than ever because of that uh, government intervention in the economy. So we know how it's done. We're just willing to put up with in non-crisis situations with the fact that 40 to 50 million people can be hungry, and that's not an emergency. We don't consider that to be an emergency. So Maine has passed the nation's first right to food amendment. Compared to the United Nations protocol, it's a little watered down, but this is how things like this begin. This was what was politically feasible. This fit into the proverbial Overton window in the politics of the state of Maine. But based on that, there are other states now that are beginning to follow up. So I've just come back um, from visiting folks at the West Virginia Food and Farm Coalition that are looking at Maine, using that template, and attempting to get a similar program established there. So that's no hunger. We know how to do that. Healthy food. Well, again, we know how to do this. This is probably the briefest explanation that I need to give you. The government defines what a healthy diet is. There is a perfectly well-documented set of dietary guidelines updated every five years by the nation's research establishment in medicine and in nutrition. And they put out a recommendation that consistently can be summarized as eat mostly plants and sparing amounts of lean meat. And um, one thing that I must tell you about this is that it seems to me like the simplest thing to do to say, as long as we're investing in the system, these are public tax dollars, then we should pay for what the government recommends that we eat and nothing else. There is no argument that I can think of for the public to be investing in the production of anything that makes us sick. But here is what we can be investing in, the sorts of food systems that all of you here are working on creating. That's where we should invest our resources because this is what that food system is going to deliver. Everybody else who wants to continue to produce the, the sweeteners, the additives, the starch, all of the other industrial products that come from the majority of what's being produced, you know, biofuels, bioplastics, and so on, it's a free country. They should be able to continue to do that. They should just do that in the market. There's no argument for the public to support them. Now, historically, the reason why we're in the country of supporting all of the folks that are producing just industrial products out of agriculture, and we'll come back and talk about this just a little bit more, is that we think we're supporting farmers. You know, we have this idea that those of us that are not producing our food are dependent on all of the folks that are producing food. I will document for you in just a little bit the fact that the majority of farmers out there are not producing food. And so we are supporting just an industrial sector out there believing that we're supporting the farmers that are producing our food. So there's a very small set of farmers whom we do need to support, and they are the folks that are producing this kind of food supply. Now, that is healthy food. Now, let's talk about investment in agroecological production. And remember, what I quickly summarize about this is this is applying what we know about the way that the planet works, the way that nature works, and the fact that there is a way to become a part of natural cycles while obtaining our food and not destroying those natural cycles. So uh, what I'm going to do here is to describe to you an idea that was refined by Stephen Gleesman in what he calls five different categories of agroecology. And the first one is something that if, if you're acquainted with agriculture at all, in agricultural circles is referred to as sustainable intensification. It's basically the idea that because you're paying for inputs, you should care about the efficiency of the use of those inputs and not waste them. So in theory, you should have an incentive not to waste nitrogen fertilizer. Now, this breaks down for all kinds of reasons that, you know, this is not that talk, so I won't get into it, but that, that actually does not work. The, the rationale does not work. But sustainable intensification holds that the first level of becoming more agroecological is to try not to waste the resources that you're paying for. The second level is to substitute synthetic inputs into the system. And so organic farming would be like this. But you can farm organically in a way that still supports monocultures, for instance, or that still depends on intensive tillage and erosion, or that depends on oil in other forms, such as plastic tarps for a mulch, uh, for instance. But it's an advance on sustainable intensification. And the third level of agroecology is when you actually involve biodiversity into the system. You change the architecture of the cropping system because you know that there is a specific job that different 
components of the cropping system are doing. Some may be fixing nitrogen, some may be building carbon in the soil, and some may be producing the food. But you include that idea. And the fourth level is that you actually recognize that this is all an economic uh, activity and that you need to support the folks that are engaged in this activity if you are going to call it successful, which ultimately leads to the fifth level, which is that this should not be a task in the food system where we depend on a reliable, consistent supply of food to one of the biggest vulnerabilities of the supply and demand theory uh, in uh, its application to food systems, which is basically the idea that if those signals actually did control how much food we produced, you know right away what that would imply. There would need to be crop failure and hunger for the signal to produce more to kick in and farmers to produce more. Then there would be a boom where farmers would be overproducing and therefore the value of what they're producing would decrease and their incomes would go down. And that's the way that supply and demand works. Obviously in the food system we can't have those sorts of things. So we all have an interest in having a stable food supply, and that's the major argument for intervening in the food system. And so that means that there needs to be policy that supports this fifth level of agroecology, basically applying agricultural principles on the firm knowledge of the way that the planet works with the eye on the ball that the system needs to benefit people, not make them sick, not concentrate wealth not create more inequality, which is what the industrial system has done. So this is the story on agroecological systems. Now, uh, let me talk to you now about how we can get there. Uh, this is a paper from uh, Marcia Delange, who until recently was our research director, and Albie Miles and Liz Carlisle, uh, uh, partners who were then at the uh, University of California at Berkeley who basically asked the question, how much is the federal government investing in agroecology right now? And so here are the, the goods. It basically, with the cooperation of the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, which is the major arm through which extramural research funding is paid for by the United States Department of Agriculture, basically took a look through the prism of those five levels of agroecology and asked the question, where is the USDA investing its resources? So you will not be surprised to learn that the USDA invests primarily in industrial agricultural systems, in other words, that extractive system. So the conclusion of theirs was that of 294 million in grants that are made by the National Institute of Food and Agriculture in 2014, the last uh, available database that they were able to work with, only 12 million, in other words, 4% of that investment supported transformative agroecology. That's that level four, level five agroecology. So obviously, we're not investing in learning more about this, much less in teaching it, much less in extending it so that it's adopted by farmers far and wide. But that should be our priority if we care anything at all about the human prospect because that prospect will be contingent on us adopting this style of agriculture. So if you think those three transformations would be difficult, I have to accept, before I even tell you about this, here will be the biggest transformation. I'll just tell you from the outset what it is. It's land reform. And it will take care of many of the dysfunctions that I've just uh, summarized for you. But I need to walk you through it. So here's a chart uh, that we did last year uh, that started out by us taking a look at the degree of black farmland loss. But essentially, what this illustrates is where we have the highest levels of cropland consolidation. It's intuitive that red is where we have the greatest consolidation across the country. This means more and more land is falling into fewer and fewer hands. Now, we'll come back and iterate on that theme many, many times. That's a problem for a number of different reasons. But let me quote to you from Adam Smith again. Here's what Adam Smith would have said about that issue. Actually, what he did say. So in The Wealth of Nations, he said, every successive generation of men have an equal right to the earth and to all that it possesses. I'll repeat to you the era in which they were living. They were trying to figure out how they could unyoke themselves from absolutist monarchs and figure out a way in which we could all govern ourselves fairly, but dealing with the argument that was rife at the time and that you all will remember was subject of uh, active uh, debate among philosophers, which was that we clearly are self-interested 
folks. We clearly are exploitative. Giving any opportunity to exploit in our own self-interest, we will do that. So how are we going to create a benevolent government? So this was what Adam Smith and his cohort were trying to figure out. And to them, a single family owning land, bequeathing it generation to generation, reminded them of feudalism, which was the power that led to monarchies. They were trying to eliminate that. So Anna Smith did not believe that it was right to bequeath land so that only one family owned it in perpetuity. And Anna Smith was not the only person that believed that way. There was an exchange between Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. And here's Thomas Jefferson, the author. The earth should belong only to the living generation who ought to hold it and usufruct. That means actually benefit from it. Every kind of regime, law, and debt should expire each generation thus renewing the human lease on the common treasury of the earth. So these individuals, you know, uh, bastions in the age of enlightenment that gave us modernity in terms of uh, our current governance systems, did not believe that it was equitable for a single family to own land generation upon generation. But yet, that's the system that we have. And generation upon generation, families who received the land that was stolen from folks like Heather's tribe and received government investment have been enriching themselves to the point where their aggregate wealth now is about four trillion. And they're among the, now this is an average I'm quoting for you, but they're among the wealthiest families in the nation. USDA Economic Research Service does a periodic report. The latest data that I'll quote to you from the end of last month is that the average farm family, remember this is the average figure, has an income of $190,000 a year. Compared against the taxpayers that are helping to create that wealth for farmers, which is about $165,000 a year, compared against the annual income of farm workers without which the entire food system would not work, which is $30,000 a year, just for you to have a comparison. Now, with that background, then we need to think about how land reform might actually be done. So here's basically the figure that I just showed you. The uh, value of farm wealth is at historical highs, which means that access to farmland is at historical highs. Farmland prices are through the roof right now. One of the major reasons is that the way that you get access to federal subsidies and support is to have farmland. So the value of those subsidies is capitalized into the value of land. So you can't break into this system. If you got homesteading land stolen from Native Americans in the 1860s, that was the key to you being wealthy right now on farmland. And so this is the thing that needs to be broken. Now, I'm showing you here the data that I told you we'd come back to. Summarize very quickly. What you see here is, again, from the USDA Economic Research Service, a breakdown of farms by size. You see on the x-axis the USDA's definition of what a small, mid-sized, large-scale uh, farm is. Now, uh, the non-family category basically means those are corporate farms. So the, the majority of farms in the United States are family farms, although the largest family farms have a corporate structure. So here's the thing to note. Uh, essentially, 11% of the farms, so those are the three columns that you see on the right-hand side there, are producing pretty close to 90% of agricultural output. I'm underscoring output because, as we'll see in just a little bit, that's not food. We should not be confused by saying we should support them because they're producing our food supply. The majority of it, not is, of it is not our food supply. We'll, we'll see that clearly in just a little bit. And so the reason for reviewing that is just to make the point that we do not need to keep the existing structure of the system in order to preserve our access to an abundant supply of nourishing food. Now, let me take this by pieces. This is research by Megan Konar at the University of Illinois. She could not have known when she started to do this research how relevant it would be in our era. She published it just before the pandemic. And what she was researching was food flows, how vulnerable our food system might be to disruptions. That was her research question. And what she concluded, remember, this was before the pandemic. She said that the system was so specialized among very narrow distribution tracks that it was really vulnerable to disruption. I mean, you see the major flows that she documented county by county in the United States. 
Essentially, she would not have written this, but this is what you would get from her article. If I were a terrorist and I wanted to disrupt the economy and the food security of the United States, there's very simple things that I would do. I would bomb the port of Los Angeles. That is the biggest flux of food into and outside of the United States. I bombed the port of Los Angeles. Then I bombed two or three key bridges on Interstate 80, which is a key east-west way of transporting food by semi-truck. Uh, some of those same bridges also are the bridges that the rail system utilized to, utilizes to transport primarily frozen uh, fruits and vegetables. Um, also, what I would do is definitely bomb locks 52 and 53 on the Ohio River. If I did that, because the food system is calibrated on a just-in-time delivery model, I would completely disrupt the food system of the United States for weeks on end. It would be a major crisis. If I were a terrorist and I were perverse, that's what I would do. Now, fortunately, there has not been a terrorist who has gotten that idea from reading research papers from the University of Illinois, but the pandemic demonstrated that just as effectively. So that system needs to be converted into food webs that operate the way that the internet does, which is basically a network of networks that was constructed specifically to the specification that if one of those networks went down, there would be abundance of overlapping networks that would take over the function of the missing network. And therefore, most of us would not notice that there had been a disruption in a given node. The system was built on the idea of compensation and resilience. So that's the sort of thing that needs to be created for the food system. That means that we need a completely different structure of the system. Not 10,000 acre farms and very small numbers of processors and distributors throughout the nation. We have a need for lots of small farms. They're producing the nourishing food supply that I've been harping upon and local regional distribution of what is being produced. That is the most reliable, less vulnerable system to disruption, according to Megan's research. OK, now let me show you then how that might look, uh, because I know the question in the back of your mind as well, really. Uh, is that going to be able to feed ourselves? Um, so let me demonstrate to you. This is uh, research from Julie Kurtz, at, uh, who's now at USDA, but when she did this research, was a graduate student at Tufts. And essentially, she asked this question. She said, what is the capacity for us to feed ourselves on a local and regional level? Now, you do not need to be a specialist in food systems to know, well, before I can answer that question, I need to ask, where are you? Because different regions have different bioproductive capacities. And then I need to ask, what are you eating? Because if you want to eat a piece of meat three times the size of your head three times a day, that's going to be more expensive than if you eat the kind of dinner that we had this evening. So they took that into account, did this study in 378 metropolitan uh, reporting districts, statistical reporting districts across the country, um, and they defined seven different dietary regimes. The baseline regime, the, bay, the way we actually eat, uh, what they call a positive control, which is the way that we actually eat, but subject to the constraint that they removed added sugars. And all of the dietary um, regimes that they looked at they made sure that we met our caloric requirements. The rest of these are basically various degrees of omnivory, from 100%, 80%, 50%, 20%, and fully vegan diet. Seven different dietary regimes. So here's essentially what they did. They broke down the sources of food to uh, cropland, pasture land, and perennial land for the different sources of food. You know, fruits would come from different places than nuts would come from different places than vegetables. So they took all of that into account. Now, the only thing you need to know as we go through a lot of information really quickly here is that when you look at each of these dietary regimes, the greener the color, the more viable the local food system is. Now, you, I, here's something that everybody should exercise their mind on doing. Think what you would predict. What you would predict is that where you have the highest population density and or where you have the lowest available water, you would have the need to import the most food. That's what you should be expecting. So compare that against what the data will show. The redder the areas, the more the need for importation of food. So look at Southern California, uh, for instance, a desert area, bright red, just for you to have a template. 
Uh, take a look at the area where we're in right now, surrounding Rhode Island. You see that little arc of red there? Okay, so now let me just go through this really quickly. Here's the 80% omnivore diet. There's the 50%. There's the 20%. There's the ovo vegetarian diet. So they took every permutation they could think of into account. By and large, what you should see as we go through these, there's the completely vegan diet. Look at all the green spots all over the place. In other words, this, neither they nor I are saying we all need to become vegan. What they and I am saying is it does depend how you eat, you know, how expensive your diet is, what the answer is to the question, can we feed ourselves? And that there's a lot of runway to how we can feed ourselves locally and regionally. Essentially, you're just looking for all the green spots, trying to match them against where the population density is in the country. So that's annual cultivated cropland. Here's grazing land, again, for each one of those. And now that you see the pattern, I'll just let you judge the changes in colors as we go through each one of the different stages. Here's perennial cropland. And one of the things that Julie and her team did was to make sure that in each one of these permutations, uh, this one shouldn't surprise you, in the ovo lacto vegetarian diet, essentially the entire country could feed itself. So uh, within those 378 uh, reporting districts. So one of the things that they made sure that they did was that they not con consume all of the land in those different regions. They recognized that there needed to be land for crop rotations, for instance. They allowed for the fact that some of the land could be set aside for biofuel production or some for export. So this is also not making really unreasonable assumptions. They allowed for real-world uh, conditions. So now here's the punchline. This is the way that we actually utilize land in the United States. This is based on data from the Economic Research Service. I'm showing you the map that was produced by Bloomberg News. You can look it up, which I recommend, because as opposed to the charts from the ERS, they're really good economists and statisticians, but Bloomberg is better at giving you an infographic with a feature on it that will animate as you look at the different ways in which we look land. So look at their version uh, in which we use land. Look at their version. So here's a quick rundown of what we're taking a look at. And remember, the theme here is land reform. Um, I'm going to use round figures here. In the continental United States, there are 2 billion acres. So. Uh, Roughly half of that is the agricultural land of the United States. In that one billion acres, it's roughly 60-40 the use that we give to pasture and grazing land, which is basically the production of beef, and row crop land. Okay, so those are round figures. Now, what that means is that if you focus on the total land and then ask how much of that is producing food that we eat, you end up with an area like this, which again, using round figures, is 20% of the non-pasture and grazing land. Or it would be about 7% of the entire agricultural footprint of the United States. Any farmer will tell you, it does not take a whole lot of land to produce actual food. The system of industrial production that we have right now is the result of us having increased our capacity to produce a lot of PAP, and then asking ourselves, how can we justify continuing to produce and sell PAP, while projecting that what they're doing is producing food and that we need to support them to continue to produce that. That is not what is happening. So there's a lot of leeway for us to think about land reform. So, this uh, area that you see here as food that we eat gives us an opportunity to really rethink the entire food system because then the question is, well, if we really just supported folks that are producing food that we eat on 20% of what is now the row crop land, by the way, that's 77.4 million acres. That doesn't need to be in the Midwest. What we saw from the Kurt study is it better be around the areas where we live. It could be urban, peri-urban, ex-urban areas that could produce the food supply that we need. And that gives us the opportunity to break the white generational chokehold on the ownership of land and the building of generational wealth and ask who in the urban, peri-urban, ex-urban areas is interested in learning how to produce stuff that we actually eat with our support. We'll help you learn how to do that. We'll support you as you learn 
as you transition, as things go wrong, we'll do what we did for 12 generations of farmers here, six generations of farmers in the Midwest, for those of you that around Boston, around Providence, around the major areas where we live, want to learn how to do this. Um, the, that lesson, by the way, was taught to me when I first uh, got to Iowa as a young idealistic person, and I happened to be in a conversation with an experienced farmer who really was kind to me, and I was trying to get at why he insisted on producing these large acreages of corn and did not get more interested in producing table food. And he said, because with a little corner of my farm, I would smother the demand for tomatoes from Des Moines. So they know it does not take a whole lot of land to produce the food that we eat. Instead, our system turns abundance into scarcity. And think about the fact that this system is expensive environmentally, namely in that it's threatening our future because it is a major greenhouse gas emitter. Nitrous oxide primarily for the production of beef and confinement uh, uh, systems, and, or, or excuse me, for the mismanagement of the nitrogen in row crop uh, production, but that is connected to the CAFO system because the majority of that is going to feed rations that make those CAFOs viable. So that's how those two are connected. And those CAFOs are generating methane as well as nitrous oxide. So we're, we're, we've got a greenhouse warming machine in the industrial agricultural system, not primarily producing the food that we eat nor the stuff that's recommended for us. So you can see here all the things that are tied up together here. This, if we break it up and give access to new generations of younger farmers that look different in urban areas and surrounding areas, we deal with a socially and racially equitable issue. And by the way, you're worried about displacing uh, white farmers. Do not be worried. Let me tell you why this would be a boon for them as well and why they would have an interest. The majority of those farmers, as you've seen, are not making a living from farming. They need to work off farm. Remember, it is only about 11% of farmers that are actually making a living from farming. And they receive the majority of federal subsidies. The rest of farming families hold on to their land. They'll tell you for sentimental reasons, but also because it's their social security. It's their kitty. And so they'll cash out when it's time to retire. That's the value of their land to them. They don't want, when they retire, the majority of those farmers don't want that land to be bought by Bill Gates or by foreign venture capitalists or to become part of the next 10,000 acre farm. There's a farm transition problem. If that land could be sold at fair market value, which is what they care about, and be put into land trusts that are returned to the native vegetation that actually created the fertile prairies or that was formerly in forested land, that draws down carbon instead of being land that's creating greenhouse gases, that's actually what we need. And this will be a boon to them, just like the federal government played a role in displacing and committing genocide to appropriate the land and then distributing among white settlers. It has a responsibility in the planet warming era to reverse that now that we know better by doing what I just described. This is logical. It's an investment in our future. And so those farm families, you don't need to worry about them. There's a way that we can make things right for them. Uh, essentially, what their ancestors did, we can't undo. They did what they did. But we have a choice about the decisions we're making right now and the future that we want to create in the future. We don't want to perpetuate that. We want to make things better. And so um, what you uh, saw here, let me just uh, get back to it because I zoomed back to it, is that uh, in the research study that I'm going to cite to you here, uh, which is just from last year, uh, you have a study from Bradbury that essentially asked the question, now that we know uh, what they would call the value of how the planet works, the, the notion of, of uh, ecosystem services is, is very anthropocentric. But we understand the way that the planet works and compare it against the value of private sector uses, such as forestry and agriculture, against the public benefit of recycling greenhouse gases, cleaning water, flood control, the things that nature does, it turns out that in, in the case of over 64 studies that they did asking that question, the majority is that you see here, stuff above the zero uh, uh, axis here, Actually, the majority of that land is more valuable in its natural state than it is in its private use. Now that we understand what nature is doing, so that's actually what we should be restoring. 
OK, so let's wind this thing up here. I told you when we started out that we had a backward inefficient system, and that I would document that for you. So now we're at the stage where we can do that. So this is a study from <coughs> Emily Cassidy. Uh, she was curious about the relative efficiency of countries around the world at feeding people. But she distinguished between brute agricultural production and the proportion of that production that was actually food. And so if you took a look at the nations of the world, and by the way, she looked at the, all of the nations of the world, and I'm just picking out some indicators here. Here's what she found out. If all of the calories that were produced in all of these nations were food, then the United States would look really good. I mean, you think about that one billion acres in agricultural production. There's a lot of land that we stole and know what to do with when it comes to producing calories. Um, but when you ask the question, how much of that is actually going into food, then this is the transformation. So it turns out that the calories that are actually delivered from what are being produced show that China actually does a much better job with its ag agricultural production. And actually, when you take a look at efficiency, so she just basically did a simple multiplication, and it basically was how much of the calories that are being produced actually ends up being food for people. And that efficiency is really high for India, because the majority of what they produce, fruits, vegetables, are very low cost to produce, first of all. They not only feed themselves rather well, a lot of the organic produce that we eat in the United States comes from India as well. So think about that when you hear about us feeding the world. But take a look at this efficiency calculated by Emily. So let's do a simple calculation here. If we take these known efficiencies, so if we take the 34% um, efficiency of the calories that we produce in the United States and multiply it by the fact that cavalierly, we waste about a third of the food that we produce. In our homes is where the majority of that waste uh, occurs. The efficiency of our food system is 10%. Now, I do not know what your standard for efficiency is, but I would not call 10% anywhere near efficient. You can have drones and self-guided tractors and the highest technology possible applied to the extractive project and do not confuse that with an efficient food system. That is not what we have. And so, here's the ultimate thing that we can do by repurposing land. It's better for the climate. It's more equitably uh, distributed. Um, we can undo what we did 500 years ago. There's plenty of land that can be returned to Heather and the 5 to 10 million people who were displaced. It should be returned to them. They should do what they will with it. With the land that's left over from that, there is sufficient land to do what I just described to you. We can undo so many things that we did wrong because we know better and have a system that's better on top of that. All of these things are possible to do. Uh, here's a study, again, just from last year that was published in Science that demonstrates that basically they are currently just on 1% of their historical lands and they are the least productive lands that we have pushed them onto, meaning that they are more susceptible to droughts, to flooding, to all of the different vicissitudes of being on poor land uh, subjects them to. And so, this is the kind of food system we could have. These are the characteristics that we can easily aim for. It's the sort of system that I know all of you are working for, and it's not going to occur just by goodwill. The system that we have right now came into being because of government investment, meaning actual policies. But if you were to scrutinize the Farm Bill, if you were to scrutinize the Child Nutrition Act, if you were going to scrutinize any of the major acts that Congress has passed that touch the food system and the agricultural system, you will not find a clear explanation anywhere of what the nation's food policy is. But if you just come in from Mars and you observed everything that I just told you, you would say, well, the explicit food policy of the United States clearly is exploit nature and people for agribusiness profit, because that's what government policies have been doing. Instead, what you folks are working on and what we can produce is a food system that provides a reliable supply of nourishing food and creates food, health, and well-being for everyone. That's the 21st food system that we can have. Thank you.
social. So, unfortunately, I think we have to leave the, the auditorium. We have a little bit of time that we can be here. But thank you again for a great talk. Sure. Well, you know, as I told you, you, you didn't really need it. All the people that preceded. No, no, we did.